So our next speaker is um, Alexander Madry, who is a professor of computer science at MIT. Um, I'll, I'll leave him to finish his introduction, his uh, numerous accolades. Um, he will be talking about data really matters. Uh, yeah, uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, let me just get my presentation started. Almost there. Hopefully, can you see it? Yes. 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 Okay, great. So welcome. So I am Alexander Madre, uh, and you know I do many things, but the things that I do over the last three years is thinking about machine learning as a tool, and in particular, paying attention to all the questions and issues that come up when we want to deploy machine learning in the real world. And you know, full disclaimer, I did not do much of ML for healthcare yet, but uh, as I will tell you towards the end of this story is that actually I started, I changed my mind and actually I realized that you know, this is a very important uh, domain to think about machine learning and to apply machine learning to. And the kind of uh, what I want to do today is tell you a little bit of, of some of the things I learned about machine learning as a tool and kind of what is important to keep in mind when you really deploy it in the context of high stakes situations, okay? So, okay, so why are we here? Well, we are here because there was this like 10 years ago around, there was this kind of breakthroughs in the context of, you know, how can we apply machine learning to various tasks that, you know, previously we did not have that much uh, of a good luck solving. In particular, one, but not the only domain is vision and there's progress on this so-called image challenge, which essentially prompted us to start believing that in particular in the context of healthcare, we can kind of deploy these models and they deliver the, the, the quality of healthcare and also the automation of healthcare that you know, previously would not uh, believe possible. So this is the big dream. And essentially like as I'm giving uh, these talks and talking to people around about machine learning, you know, the question that always arises, you know, there are all these hopes out there, but the question that always arises is, okay, are we there yet? Okay, so did we figure out what this kind of you know golden recipe, what the silver bullet is, and all that we need to do just well polish it a bit, scale it up a bit, but essentially we are already you know at the smooth sailing stage. So yeah, this is the question that I'm again getting over and over in different forms. So let me just answer it right away. The short answer is not at all. That you know definitely machine learning is not ready yet. Like it's very impressive and there is a lot of promise, but it's definitely not ready for deployment. And again. We already know that, right? Like the reason why we are here in part is that we already realize that for instance, in the context of healthcare, when you deploy models, they end up kind of uh, making decisions that are inequitable and kind of this actually uh, runs deep into like the way machine learning works. But even, you know, if the decision were equitable, they also tend to be not really robust. There is a lot of distribution shift questions uh, and problems that arise in the context of ML, especially in healthcare, I mean, in particular, like data from different hospitals or even from different units within the hospitals can be very differently annotated and kind of the performance on one type of data might not transfer over at all to the performance on other type of, uh, type of uh, data. And actually this goes even further and kind of becomes even more embarrassing where in some ways, you know, the way this machine learning, some of the deployed, or at least, you know, uh, aiming to be deployed, like ML for healthcare uh, models, they, you know, once you look deeply into how they make decision, you realize that decision making is completely flawed. And it actually doesn't bring any insights uh, beyond, you know, what can be trivially and kind of uh, trivially, trivially extracted and essentially useless from a clinical point of view. Okay, so this is where we are. So then, the obvious question is okay so what's going on here you know it was supposed to be so great so why why it is not great yet and i would say kind of you know the the like kind of the point of start of trying to provide some answers here is kind of to realize that when we think about ml kind of we should really keep in mind the whole pipeline there okay so this pipeline in again, this is somewhat simplified but it involves data then it involves model training model on this data and kind of that's what we usually think of as of ML, but also involves users, okay? And really, you know, if you look at development, at least, at least a research in ML so far, uh, kind of the focus seems to be immensely on the models, kind of that's where we kind of believe the innovation kind of is the most important. And in some ways, I think this was true 10 years ago, 
but it definitely is not true right now. Like I think we are kind of getting to the diminishing uh, returns uh, like curve, like diminishing returns here. And, you know, it's in some ways, this is a little bit of like, you know, looking for the, you know, looking for the key under the, you know, under the, uh, under the light, because you know, that's where it's, you know, when we can see better, as opposed to trying to see where the problems actually are, because yes, it's, it's the easiest to intervene on models and the easiest to iterate on models. But again, I think we roughly are there already, or at least we are relatively advanced. What kind of is really missing right now, and this is kind of, there's one thing from this talk that I would like you to take away, is that we really should have much, much more serious look into data and in particular understanding how it influences what our models learn and how they operate and also users in terms of what users expect from this machine learning to get and also you know, in what way the task that the users want the, the model to solve might not be what the task that the model actually solved. Okay, so yeah, so again, in particular as the title of my talk is, you know, data really matters. So the question is why, okay? And somehow I think, again, I will not be saying this talk anything too surprising if you actually work with ML, but I, I do, it does feel that, you know, the field maybe did not internalize the knowledge fully yet. So that's why I'm repeating it is, but kind of, I think the key realization here is to realize what our models that we are using currently really are, okay? At least in the context of vision, you know, again, they are very impressive models and they kind of get very in, in, in an impressive performance or like, you know, in some ways do things that we couldn't do before, but really what they are is you should think of them as just extremely good correlation extractors, okay? So in some, in some ways, like if I have a vision model and I want to kind of use it to recognize or learn, you know, cat versus dogs, kind of like how to distinguish cat versus dogs, what they really will do, you know, in simplifying a bit is that they will just figure out that they're really insanely good at this. A set of features, like maybe shape of the ear, kind of the factor of the fur and so on, that kind of tends to like, you know, correlate more with one label, label of a cat versus label of the dog or vice versa. And then the way the prediction happens is that whenever they see an image, they really they see an input, they look for the features that appear there. And essentially, if they tend to be usually correlated with you know one label versus the other, that's how they make this. Okay. And again, it is a lot of very impressive things that you can, you know, th that you can do using this, uh, you know, uh, using this, uh, this paradigm. And again, that's what much of the performance we are observing currently is coming from. But like, you know, so this is a good thing, but like, why is realizing this important? Well, first of all, it's important to realize that, and this we all know by now, is that like correlation is not causation, but actually there is even more to that, okay? So first of all, like if all that our models are doing is just be kind of extracting correlations with, from data and acting according to that, well, the problem with that is that correlations can be planted in data, okay? So just to give you an idea, imagine I have a training set of cats versus dogs, and what I will do is I will essentially just like go over this training set and I will like for every picture of a dog, I will make the top left pixel be uh, orange. And for every, uh, for every picture of a cat, I will make the top left uh, pixel be blue. And imagine that I now train the model on that, uh, on that training set. What will this model do? Well, this model will have very little incentive to actually learn any features that really we would associate with dogs and cats. All that we really figure out is saying, well, I can, you know, if I look at my training set, I can get the right answer by just looking at this top left pixel. Okay, so essentially, in some ways, what will happen is that this adding this correlation, planting this correlation in data completely hijacked uh, the decision, you know, decision making of this model. And, you know, this is kind of clearly what would not be intended. And in particular, there is a whole uh, field of uh, so-called, like, like this is usually called as backdoor attacks, essentially in machine learning security, people kind of worry about this kind of attacks where there's an adversary that plants some collision in the model and our model just then blindly extracts it, which makes it vulnerable and possible to zero. Okay, so this is though, like from our perspective, we don't expect people to go and plant bad correlation in our data, but, you know, we need to be aware of the possibility. And the reason why we need to be aware of the possibility is that actually this kind of, you know, confusing correlations arise in real world data too. And actually they arise quite frequently. And again, healthcare is actually ripe with this kind of story. So, okay, so there is a story of 
kind of there was a, a you know a, a, a like convolutional neural network was supposed to recognize if someone has tuberculosis or not based on the x-ray what really ended up uh, happening is that this network was really relying on what type of machine uh, was uh, kind of was this x-ray taken with and the reason was that tuberculosis is rare in the, in developed countries so you know the positive examples had to be shipped from a you know from a different country and they are using all their machines and that was a strong signal here you know the other story is you know there was a app that was supposed to recognize if the change of uh, you know like if the change on the skill is malignant or not and again, the signal here, which you know the model used as uh, viewed as useful, was whether there was a ruler in this picture or not. Because physicians, when you go uh, when they take the picture, they actually will put the ruler there, right? So again, so kind of the you know the pattern here is that you know things correlations that seem to be useful and very helpful are actually not really uh, 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 are not really what we would like our models to do, okay? And you know, moreover. Uh, uh, this is not, uh, you know, this is not just an uh, unlucky ex accident, okay? So this is not just that, oh, you know, in this data, maybe, you know, we did not think to control for the, like, source of the data from the point of view of the machine, X-ray machine that they taken or figure out that we should be, like, be care mindful of the, of the ruler. Like, this actually ends up to be, uh, like, this kind of biases, this kind of, like, missing correlations are actually a natural result of a flawed and quite understudied data pipeline that we are using in machine learning. Okay, so in, in particular, they are not just accidents; they actually uh, happen for uh, for uh, systemic reasons. So, just to give you a little bit of a flavor of how this happens, so like let's just think about the current way we create data sets. Okay, at least in vision. Okay, so the way we do. Well, okay, so, so sorry. So there is a way how we do it, like how we imagine this is supposed to be happening. So we imagine that you know, someone goes and takes the pictures that like goes in the world and takes the picture of all the objects you would like to classify in the natural uh, uh, habitat. And then we have expert annotator that looks at each picture and figures out what is the correct classification annotation for this image. And then we kind of train our model on this data with some you know, uh, meaningful benchmarks. And then we have this heavily uh, ever after, a uh, happily ever after kind of situation that we are uh, envisioning. For. And again, this is a nice idealization. This is a nice concept to have. Unfortunately, it just does not scale to, to the millions of images that we need for computer for the modern computer imaging vision systems. So what we actually do is something quite different, seemingly similar, but actually you know, uh, different in important ways, in which we kind of we don't go and take the pictures ourselves. We just scrape the images from you know from Flickr or from social uh, social media. Then we use mTurkers, like you know, crowd, uh, crowd, uh, crowdsource uh, annotators, to label this data, and this results in these annotations being noisy and biased. And then we don't have very meaningful benchmarks. We just try to optimize for some accuracy on the holdout set or uh, what have you. And then, well, then we end up in the situation we are right now, where yes, we have a pipeline that is scalable; it's widely used, but it really introduces unwanted correlations. Uh, at every step of this process, okay? So that just to dive a little bit deeper, like what we did in, in my group is just try to look into these questions in the context of ImageNet, which is one of the most, most heavily studied uh, uh, data set in the machine learning in context of vision. And actually many of the healthcare models are pre-trained on ImageNet. And essentially like we notice a lot of troubling things. So first is that there is a lot of spurious and desired correlations that arise by design. So just like, let's think about, for instance, what fish mean means according to ImageNet, okay? So remember, ImageNet was sourced from Flickr, which is a, like, which is a social media uh, platform. And like, what do fish look like on social networks? Well, if you look at the examples of fish in this, you know, in this, in this data set, you realize that a lot of them are not fish swimming in the ocean, but they actually there are fish being held by people because they just, uh, they just fished it and they wanted to show that their friends what they, what they found, what they caught. And now imagine, okay, we know, of course, where this fish in this picture, but imagine that you just, there is a model that doesn't know any of this. It just looks for collections. What will this model realize? Well, if we figure out, and this is what we uncovered, is that essentially like anything that has a, you know, a man holding something like this or holding something like that, you know, probably is a fish, no matter if the actual fish is there or not. So kind of we, we did the study and kind of, you know, if you look at this background, you can put almost any object uh, overlaid on over this, and the model will still believe that this is a fish. Okay, so that's one way in which these correlations uh, arise. 
Uh, but also this correlation can come from the task itself. So in particular, like ImageNet has this notion, it's a classification task. It just kind of has this notion that each image has an assigned single ground truth label. But what we found when we looked into it is actually there is like, you know, at least more than 20% of images we looked at had multiple valid objects. So here's just an example, like this is something that to us probably would be a stage, but actually ImageNet claims it's an acoustic guitar because indeed there's also an acoustic guitar here. Uh, and then kind of what, uh, what figures out is that like, it's not only that, you know, there are these multi-object images that kind of we expect only one correct answer there, but sometimes the correct answer is actually not the answer that you as a human would assign here. So this is an example where in which, you know, kind of if I ask you what's in this picture, you would say church, but actually image uh, claims it's the bell cut. And the reason is that the way this kind of image came up is when the kind of when the uh, data creators uh, like uh, like ask Flickr for images of a bell code. And again, there are some biases that come from that. And again, it's not only that these labels are wrong, it's but that our models believe that these labels are right. And that's how they learn to recognize the object and solve the task. Okay, so this was just a study of an image net, but it's really not just an image net problem. And again, we kind of have this current ML paradigm in which we think, okay, we have this training set on which we over, over uh, optimize, and we expect that this, this kind of performance will generalize to the tests that we have not seen. And then we also expect that at some point, you know, we will kind of robustly generalize uh, 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 to, to everything. But kind of in all of this, kind of there's this implicit assumption that, you know, that doing well on this data, the moment we robustly kind of, our accuracy is robust to the distribution shift, we kind of expect that also doing well on this data will really solve the task at hand. And that really is not the case. And kind of, it's really the most important thing to understand about the current machine learning models. And kind of that's something that we kind of uncover over and over is that this success at the task really, like if we just get good accuracy on our test set, does not mean that our model is learning the right concepts, the concepts that we intend uh, them to learn. So where to go from this, uh, from, the, uh, from here? As I said, the important thing is to really think about data and users in this whole pipeline. So yes, we have great models, but now we have to think about how to understand the generative model behind you know, the data sources, because they influence what models learn greatly. And also how to put humans, users in the loop to make sure that, you know, that actually our models are aligned with what we want to get. And you know, overall, I just want to say that kind of, we need to recognize that ML is a sharp knife or like a scalpel you know, pun intended, and not a hammer. So we should essentially think, okay, so the ML researchers have to recognize that, you know, we need to embrace the complexity and messiness of the healthcare data. And there is many of concrete kind of actions we can take here, but also the healthcare practitioners need to really work with us to maybe in particular make this, you know, the data that we, uh, like that we generate from a healthcare system to be more ML friendly. And then there is much more to be, to be done here. Okay, so yeah, so that's all I have today and yeah, I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you so much, Alec. Um, I, again, I think we'll take the questions at the, at the end of all of the, all of the talks. That was great, the, the reminder about the data and the user in this process often gets lost. And uh, that was, uh, those examples actually quite, quite stunning.